Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Racken, and welcome back to Digital Rebar Platform Meetup number 43. Today, we have some fun and exciting business. Uh, we have some demos. If we can uh, appease the demo gods, they're a little rough right now. Um, we shall see how that goes. We're going to talk about Profile and Profiles, a new feature that Digital Rebar uh, platform has grown, which allows us to do some cool things. We'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the validation content. It's a recent content pack that's been added. Uh, it's relatively young and has a lot of things that it needs to become a full-fledged, real interesting tool, but it's growing in interesting directions and allows us to do some cool things. We'll talk about validation. And we have some very exciting news. Uh, we've been hard at work over the last uh, month or so, um, adding in, uh, actually two or three months, uh, adding in an agent or runner, which is the equivalent of, in some respects, to DRP CLI uh, for ESXi VMware platform environment. So we've not been able to execute workflow in the ESXi environment, and now we have some capabilities in that respect. So we're going to talk about that. And then also, uh, we're going to open up the floor a little bit. We're hoping that some of you out there today with us are ARM enthusiasts. We've had a lot of sort of queries in community about ARM. We are not heavy ARM users ourselves, so we don't have a whole lot of opinion about what DRP needs to be uh, ultra badass when it comes to ARM. And so we're hoping some of you out there have some interesting information. Uh, we have a pretty big crew from the RackN team on board, uh, so we should hopefully be able to answer a lot of questions uh, revolving around ARM. Uh, first, though, uh, let's kick off with profile and profile discussion, and then we will move into the VMware ESXi agent demo with Mike, and then as Mike is doing his demo, I'm going to madly try and fix my demo. And if I get that going, uh, I will show the validation content demo. If not, we'll walk over the validation content pieces and talk about those. And then we'll do the ARM conversation. I'm going to pass the mic over to Rob and let Rob sort of uh, MC the discussion uh, with Greg. And I assume, uh, is Victor in the background with you there, Greg? Greg's muted. I'm muting he... now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we got Greg and Victor online as well to help talk about uh, some of the changes that uh, Profile and Profile gives us. Uh, Rob, take it away. On the ARM side or Profile? Oh, you just want me to MC? Profile and Profile. profile just MC and Profile and Profile. Uh, this is a really cool thing. Um, yeah, but I'm just going to hand it over to Greg to talk about Profile and Profiles and Parameter and Parameter. And I'll take notes. This has been, oh, a long okay. it's been a long time coming, so. All right, so um, profile and profile. So the idea is that we were beginning to see a usage pattern of um, very large profiles, right? In fact, we saw some in uh, Dave Roberts, uh, or David Roberts, not David Roberts, David Young's, sorry, um, oh, yeah. crib work, where he's got this huge monstrous set of profiles that have like 10,000 parameters and stuff like that. And in actuality, a lot of those are getting cross-referenced in other profiles. So we think of it like, say I want to configure my RAID device. Well, that RAID config is probably the same across most of your systems. So why do I want to replicate that parameter everywhere? I just want to say, here's a parameter that represents a RAID 1 with the rest being RAID 5. And so given that as a model, I could define a profile that represents just that parameter. And then everywhere I wanted to include that, I could put that in the other profiles in the profile list for that profile. Yeah, that's coming out weird. But nonetheless, the idea there is that if I found a bug in that one config piece, I could then go edit that sub profile. And there are all the rest of my profiles that reference it, pick it up. And I don't have to deal with finding all my profiles that use that same kind of config and fix it. So it gave us a way to kind of do some parameter reuse and direction and uh, quit bloating some of these profiles. So um, you'll note it, uh, did we do the UX work for this? Maybe. I think there was, yeah, there was UX work. 
because uh, it's uh, you can you can actually go in and pick them. So it's 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 exposed in the UX. Um. So anyway, the um. Let me see if I have it on my UX screen here. Where to go? Yay, okay. So let me share real quick. Well, uh, you need to stop sharing, Shane. Or whoever's sharing. It's Shane. Yeah, there you go. I like sharing. I know. Caring. It's almost like caring. But <laughs> okay, so in our handy dandy UI, I've gone into a uh, profile. Um, you'll see it now has a selector here that lets you select a whole set of profiles, then you can save it. And which one did I edit? Hmm. There we go. Oh, that's it. That was my cluster. There we go. <laughs> Of course, apparently that doesn't work. Sigh. All right, so apparently the UX doesn't let you do it, so you have to do it through the CLI. So it looks like it could maybe do it, but it doesn't actually save it. Um, so we'll be fixing that. Um, but the idea is that's where you would do it. The CLI works, the unit tests actually are out there that kind of validate it some, so it's available in that regard. But that's kind of it. That's pretty straightforward and simple in that regard. Sorry, any questions? Um, unlimited depth? Yes, it recurses. Um, the yep. idea is that uh, it's actually a good question. Thank you for asking. So within the hierarchy of expansion, um, the parameters specified directly on the pro profile are first, and then profiles in order are expanded. So you kind of do a uh, um, depth first walk of the profile. So walk completely through the first one. If you find the parameter it's used, then you walk through the next one completely and totally. And then the system has loop protection so if you generate a loop of profiles, as soon as it finds itself re-entering a profile it's already evaluated, it stops evaluating there and then goes on to the next level or the next profile. So um, we try and prevent you from doing silly things. Well, but, will it log that it found a circular dependency like that? It does not. It mostly hides it and eats it. Okay. Um, there are some cases where we will attempt to validate that where we can, and you'll get a warning like on a content pack load or something like that, if it's there. But which, which we've tried to make it benign, so. What, which order does it go in if it finds duplicate params in those profiles? It never finds duplicates. When it finds the first one, it stops. For the param, okay. <coughs> Yeah, so remember, this is for the rendering side. So when the renderer goes and says, I need to render a parameter, mm -hmm. it starts walking through the set, and it stops when it finds the first one. There's a caveat to that, but for now, we'll leave it. <laughs> There's a new render function for param called uh, param mind, I think. And that actually walks all of the pro parameters within the hierarchy and aggregates the answer. This is only useful for arrays and maps. So the idea, and in fact, this is useful because it will come up in the validation component discussion. But, so we'll talk about it more in a minute. Good question. Any others? 
I, I have one other comment to make about profiles and profiles from an Ansible perspective, because the other thing we did um, that's in the, the dev, dev branches is modified the Ansible scripts to use this instead of the hacky um, parent, Ansible parent parameter. So in going forward, if you want to do Ansible group uh, parent-child relationships, use profile and profiles for that. Which is our first sort of use case outside of uh, customer actual profile and profile deployment is Ansible content using that for the parent-child relationships. Pretty cool. Yeah, with, with that one change, the uh, Ansible, we have a, per, a complete mapping of rebar profiles and parameters into Ansible. So you can completely recreate an Ansible inventory file with native constructs. So it's pretty nice. Right. Very cool. All right, uh, VMware, ESXi agent, and well, actually any last questions on the validation or the profile and profile stuff there? We, we also comments? did params and params, right? No. No? We <laughs> no, we did workflows no. and workflows. Just no, profiles and profiles. Sorry. Okay. Can we like don't say workflows and workflows. Greg will explode. Die, scum. It's not a few. <laughs> okay. I keep, I keep, okay. I keep thinking there was like a parameter cross reference thing. No. <laughs> okay, so uh, no more on profiles and profiles. Uh, it is only profiles and profiles. It's not params and params. It's not workflow and workflows. It's not workflows and profiles or prams or uh, whatever crazy combination you can come up with. Or a fox on a train. <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, ESXi agent and runner. Um, first off, um, most of you uh, who operate digital rebar provision are familiar with our workflow. Our workflow is one of the major components that makes what ERP is and the rack end capabilities uh, unique and so amazingly powerful. Uh, that is executed through the DRP CLI, uh, CLI binary, which is cross compiled for a number of platforms. Uh, since the CLI is sort of an implementation of the API and does direct conversation communication with the uh, API endpoint, uh, it seemed only natural to uh, use it, the CLI tool itself, with a special mode sort of added into it to be able to execute and uh, run workflow, which workflow just uh, ultimately is decomposed to a set of tasks of things to do. And so DRP CLI would take that workflow list of tasks and ex execute those as jobs and be able to, via the API, communicate back to the endpoint and do interesting things. And then you were able to also leverage the DRP CLI binary itself within content uh, and plugins to do powerful things within templates. Well, we started operating with the VMware ESXi platform pretty heavily with a number of customer engagements. And in those cases, uh, we wanted to be able to do uh, the uh, workflow capabilities within ESXi. But unfortunately, lo and behold, uh, VMware's ESXi platform is a closed appliance. Uh, Golang doesn't have the ability to cross-compile binaries for the ESXi target platform, and subsequently, uh, you can't have workflow. <laughs> so to be able to do mass deployments of ESXi, what we were doing was a heavily templatized, uh, very painful uh, kickstart process where we lost a lot of visibility to the installation path. And as many of you know, um, one of the things that we really work hard to do is make uh, installation uh, much more apparent what's happening. To be able to, to operate uh, workflow, receive the standard out, standard error logging of whatever's happening and have that co-located, centralized on a DRP endpoint is a significant advantage over kickstart and uh, precede uh, package-based install environments where everything sort of goes dark and you lose uh, visibility to what's happening in the install process, getting logging information back is kind of a hard uh, task to do in a meaningful way. And so ESXi installs in the Weasel Kickstart environment, 
uh, once they kicked off, they were kind of cross your fingers and, and hope um, that everything goes smoothly and it gets done and you're not going to have to go spelunking through ESXi random logs. If you haven't rebooted the machine, if you rebooted the machine, they're non-persistent and then you're back to square one. Okay, so all of that said, we uh, embarked finally upon uh, building a agent in Python because Python is natively available within the SXI uh, appliance environment. So we've started implementing um, a Python-based agent or runner that has an, a limited ability to execute workflow. It's not a full DRP CLI, but it has a limited ability to execute workflow and tasks and feed that information back to the digital rebar provision endpoint. And lo and behold, we now are bringing VMware ESXi up to parity uh, with some of the other operating systems, at least in the ability to operate uh, uh, workflow and uh, tasks uh, within driving, driving all of that through the digital rebar platform. Most of that work was um, performed and done by uh, Mike Rice, who's one of our, um, I guess we can't call him uh, Mike our, our um, newbie anymore. So uh, our ex-newbie, Mike, uh, he has shed that uh, dubious honor, I guess, of being the TNG <laughs> or the FNG, <laughs> however you want to call it. Um, but Mike uh, did a lot of the work, uh, Python work, to implement the agent and runner, and he has been putting together a little bit of a demo and will show us uh, some of those efforts of uh, what he's been doing. If I'm not stepping all over his toes here, a quick outline. Uh, when the ESXi installer starts, it's very much similar to uh, Linux or any of the other kickstart environments. The kickstart process kicks off, a kernel and NITRD are loaded. That installation environment, uh, ESXi calls Weasel, uh, which executes the kickstart uh, configuration file. Uh, we embed in it the uh, download and start of the agent, which we call Derpy or Dr. Pi, depending on who you ask. If you say Derpy in uh, chat, we get a Slackbot response. So everybody calls it DR Dr. Pi in Slack, so you don't get the <laughs> Slackbot response, whatever. Uh, Derpy or Dr. Pi is the actual agent that runs in the kickstart process. And part of that is you can set up the agent to also on first boot, uh, execute and run workflow. Uh, with that said, uh, Mike, you ready to take it away and show us what you've got uh, brewing there? Yes, hello. All right. Cool. How do I take control of this thing? Should be able to just do it. Uh, it should be at the bottom of it on the share screen mm -hmm. on the Chrome at the bottom. Mm. I have a uh, stop video. <laughs> John Lee. Oh, share. There it is. Okay. Let's see. How's that? Is that working? Good. Okay, yep. cool. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, what we have here is um, demo pass and demo fail. I'm going to go ahead and kick these off right now because it takes a few minutes. Um, oops. And I'll talk about them as they uh, as they go. So whoops. Okay. So what what this is going to do um, is go through and install uh, ESXi. Um, one, one of them is going to pass and one of them is going to fail. Um, so the, the, the way it's going to fail, um, if we come in here and look at this workflow, uh, it's kind of cheesy. Um, Meetup, fail. This, uh, this. 
and this. Okay, so uh, we're going to get to a point where uh, in the installation we run this task. Um, it's going to be during the kickstart, and it's going to be run by the agent. Um, this could easily be a, um, a post-installation uh, validation task that we're going to be running. Um, so that's what we're going to pretend it is. And the validation... Mike, is this using... Is this using your new runner, or is this the older workflow that, that does Kickstart Magic? Uh, this uses the runner. Okay, cool. And um, so what will happen is we will reach a point during uh, the Kickstart installation where, it, um, where it's booted up, um, and it's going to be running kickstart.py. Um, during that, it runs our agent... Um, runner so that you know you can do more workflows so in in this case we're imagining that this is a uh, you know like a post provision um, validation kind of thing going through checking various whatevers um, and we're going to exit with a 16 which causes our runner to um, it causes the job to fail and the runner to sit and wait for the machine to become runnable again um, which in this case would be uh, like, let's say there was a problem with the DNS, like the host name on the machine was set correctly. Um, but after the end of the provisioning, we find out that the DNS didn't match, um, you know, what's, what's being returned. So the system stops right there. So you can go have that fixed. And then you can click the button to have uh, it rerun uh, the validation task again, um, which is where we're going to be failing. In this case, hopefully it would be fixed. And so, you know, you would just pick up where you left off in the process. In mine, it's hard coded to exit at 16. And so we're not going to be able to recover from the failure. Um, but that would be the idea is, you know, you have, have something right there. And so we'll be able to show you like where it, it just stops in the, uh, in the process. So and then one of them will come all the way through because I don't have the task for it to fail. And so it's just going to make it, you know, start to finish. Um, unfortunately, this process takes like ooh, five to seven or eight minutes, um, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Uh, it is on SSD, so it's still... Um, so I don't have a whole lot of filler for that time. If you have any questions, feel free to hand. Otherwise, it's going to get real awkward because we'll all just sit here and stare at me. Okay. Um... So in, in summary, we get the ability to uh, execute workflow um, in the ESXi environment, which was a big missing piece and caused a lot of grief. And I know that um, I was on vacation last week. And uh, one of the things I think you guys started doing is moving a lot of the current uh, kickstart components and pieces over to actual stages and tasks to be executed successfully and correctly in uh, workflow context for ESXi. And so a lot of that work will continue over the next uh, week or two. We'll start getting um, a much more fully functional VMware ESXi workflow based more purely around uh, using the agent and uh, tasks, stages, etc and moving away from that uh, opaque uh, kickstart weasel process, which is a really big win. Uh, it was a lot of problem trying to debug when things went bump uh, with the SXI installs, which often they can do. Uh, so it just makes uh, debugging a lot easier. It makes it a lot more flexible. It's a lot more the um, digital rebar way of doing things. Okay. Uh, what else do we have on the agenda? We have uh, validation content pack ARM conversation. Do we have any um, in the community, do we have any ARM enthusiasts that are here to talk? 
Um, there's a few new fa faces here, so I'm not sure if you're ARM enthusiasts, uh, Patrick Roberts, Peter uh, Russell. Um, are you here to talk about ARM stuff? David, do yeah. you care about ARM stuff? Yeah, uh, Peter here. Um, I'm uh, using uh, ARM uh, running uh, Raspberry Pi yeah, to host the, the DRP uh, provisioner and the tools around that to boot up uh, just uh, I'm doing this as a hobby in my uh, garage I have a, a couple of servers and I want to provision them and just use a small Raspberry Pi for to doing this and I have uh, set up uh, environment with uh, the version 3 before the summer and now I have some time to look at it and uh, saw that version 4 is out but uh, as I wrote on the Slack channel a couple of days ago, I missed the DR provisioning binary for Raspberry Pi, so I can't upgrade. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so to direct that, uh, Peter, um, Let's see, give me just a second. In, in Slack, or in Slack, in the chat, I just put a version. That version will have the ARM7 DR provision in its zip file. We had removed it in four because we didn't think anybody was really using the 32-bit version of ARM. Yeah, but, yeah, I see. So, yeah, I, I, before the summer, uh, I got from Rob uh, the search binary also to be able to generate search. Uh, I'm in my uh, primary uh, setup is to uh, deploy Kubernetes on uh, my server, so I am playing around with the crib stuff. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that will have that version and beyond. So we'll spend 4022 here in a bit. It will have, yeah. um, it will have the, um, the ARM7 binary in it. Now the catalog yeah, so doesn't know about ARM. We haven't been necessarily publishing the plugins with ARM support, um, it just mean it just creates a lot of extra binaries that we weren't sure people were using. Um, if Rob got you a search, then that should still function. Yeah, uh, that's not true. No, nowadays, we'll need to get you a new yeah, it won't. But you can build them yourself now. Okay, yeah, so uh, fix that. So oh, that's great. True. Yeah, the the DR provisioner. Can that be built uh, by me too, or is it? Uh, not anymore. No. So the, yeah, I, I, I... the plugins can, the binary itself can. And so it's now available. So we'll publish it for every release and put that out there. OK, that's good. Yeah, this is, this is the consequence of moving to four. So the place where you're likely to find place, things that you need to fiddle with, you'll be able to fix build your own plugins and then you know submit patches back so that those will work um, yep. for the for the for the server which is likely to be fine in these platforms um, you'll have to work with us from a debug perspective if you find platform issues yep um, but our you know and one of the things we discussed internally was 32-bit is really not a target platform for us right we're gonna yeah I, I understand that <laughs> so, yeah. Which, which is okay. Uh, if you limit your support to the Pi 3 and the Pi 4, uh, the 3B and the 4 are a Arch 64, which is 64-bit ARM. Right. Those are ones uh, that we duplicate with, with VMs internally, so testing is reasonable there. So, uh, I mean, yeah, as an enthusiast, it's something that I tried to use early on with, with um, back end just because 
equipment is cheap and it's easy to build a small lab quickly. But I, I can't imagine anybody picking up the phone and calling you guys and saying we need to provision, you know, a wall of pies tomorrow. Uh, we need a million <laughs> of them to through back end. So that's why I've never really chased you guys about it because in, in, in that case you're not, you're not going to make you're not going to use you know, DR, the dr provision server is not going to run on one of the 32 bit arms <laughs> very, very quick well yeah maybe put maybe put it on a xeon box to provision the pies but my point is just i don't think there's any money in targeting that platform for you guys which is why i never really chased you on it but um, oh, you know the, the, the other thing. alternative is we build for arm 64 so you could spring and buy a raspberry pi 4 yeah, exactly. Uh, I haven't been able yeah. to do that yet. It's, I, I have a couple of them, but it's kind of early and, uh, days there. The only, they haven't expanded their OS support fully yet to all the various Linuxes. Yeah, but I mean, at least it has an actual uh, gigabit NIC that you can actually fully saturate, so that helps. Yeah, that's true. Uh, although the two places that I, there, there may be use, you know, a use case here, I think we've talked about one already, which is, you know, we're talking about maybe putting a, a digital rebar appliance per rack and then just, you know, if we needed to reprovision an entire data center at scale, we could do it because we're not constrained, you know, resource constrained on any given server rebuilding a rack full of components, right? Um, and sort of tangentially and similarly, I've seen the Ceph guys talking to Western Digital Labs who actually put an ARM-based SBC out that was meant to be a writer that sat on uh, spinning rust. And so the idea was that you would bolt um, you know, a, a SBC onto the back of a disk, and it would be a Ceph node, one OSD you know, host. Um, but they never took it to market. So, uh, but it's just an example of someplace where I don't know if you you guys have any ends with other people who are doing sort of embedded systems, you know, because it, it, it's now that you've added the functionality to sort of do the master tier, master, uh, um, you know, distributed system down. Uh, I could see you, like I say, provisioning whole data centers or whole racks of things if you move into the IoT space, maybe. And remember, this is we're talking about the server. The 32-bit clients, the runner for 32-bit has been mm -hmm. here the whole time. This is the only difference here is this is the DR provision server side. Sure. Is the is the thing to note. The clients, yeah, the clients um, will keep supporting. And for that, the resource that we're most likely to wind up becoming constrained on is going to be uh, one of either um, memory or network bandwidth. So. Right. And it, it really depends on the scale of uh, what you're trying to manage from your little embedded device. So, and we, we sure. need to, you know, talk to, uh, you know, people who are interested in manufacturing and to see what kind of scale they're selling to, to be able to figure out how to size it and all that stuff. So. Fair enough. But yeah, when Synthon okay. and Red Hat are available back on the Pi 4, I'll, I'm sure I'll be circling back to you guys. <laughs> but it's, it's just right now, it's just Raspbian, I think. All right, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, appreciate all the feedback all right. from community on ARM, hey. as always. Yes? Hey, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Look, my yeah. demo's done. <laughs> Yeah, All I was right. just going to pass so that baton over to you to wrap up. <laughs> okay. Well, I just, I got too excited, man. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me, let me wrap up on the ARM stuff. We'll, we'll do that and then we'll move over to validation. So on the ARM stuff, as always, input pound community channel. Appreciate your feedback on your use cases to help us make the product better. Mike is extremely excited to show us a wrap up of the Derpy agent. So Mike. All right. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. So yeah. So see, we have the one that passed and it is complete and it's all done and the other one has failed. And so I am currently logged on the one that failed. Can you see me, uh, my yep. screen here? Okay, cool. Yep. So this is where we write our logs to. Um, so in, in the, an ideal situation, you would be able to correct 
this problem uh, that has um, begun happening. Um, and if you see here, uh, one of them on our failed, uh, it's still on running kickstart.py, right? So if in a ideal world, we were able to fix the thing that caused our validation to fail here, um, we would be able to come back over here, hit run. Then you see the runner goes to pick up the task and try and run it again. Normally, we would hope that it would pass and it would pick up where it left off, but because I hard-coded it to fail, that's not possible. So there you have it. Cool. Wow. Awesome. That's a big, big deal because in the past, if some, some hiccup happened in the provisioning workflow for ESX, you were basically toast until you did a reset. So in this Correct. case, if you're doing an external integration, you could literally fix it. Please. Yep, exactly. Back end, visual rebar provision, workflow, rock and roll, baby. All right, let's talk about validation now. So a little bit of what uh, uh, Mike was showing us there is validation as well in parts of that process. Um, let me see. So with Greg's kind help as he was talking, we sorted out and got a demo working for uh, validation. And all right, so validation content is a new content pack that exists in digital rebar provision content under validation directory. So this is a content pack that provides uh, the scaffolding to be able to create uh, uh, tasks or uh, templates to validate and verify that something is the way you expect it to be. So one of the problems that we've run into is uh, as customers have started uh, embracing workflow and wanting to move to fully hands-off, uh, fully automated uh, provisioning where machines are rolled in or an entire rack or racks of machines are rolled in, plugged in and powered on, and they just want to walk away from the systems and then be able to uh, have the machines walk through very complex sets of validation, or excuse me, complex workflows. Um, sometimes there are errors or problems, and usually in our experience, a lot of the problems have been in environmental. So as we integrate uh, a workflow into the infrastructure systems in an environment, Sometimes we get answers that are wrong, or sometimes we get information that's bad. And as we merrily move along our way in a 50, 60, 70, 80 task workflow, uh, that wrong information can cause a cascading set of failures that makes even with our workflow and job lock system hard to unwind sometimes. So one of the things that we've started looking at is when there are things that we know that we're relying on external data that may be questionable, can we test that data? Can we validate and verify that the information we're getting is uh, good and doesn't have any known errors? So a, a very simple uh, error that we ran into in the field regularly was around the VMware ESXi environment. So one of the things that the VMware content has is the ability to specify on first boot the IP addressing information for the machine, which might be different than its initial uh, discovery DHCP bootstrap information. So the post configuration install might be setting a VLAN, setting an IP address, a net mask, and a gateway, along with some of the other itinerant network information. But those are kind of the important bits that have to be right for that machine to work on the network. Well, in some cases, we've seen uh, the wrong net mask added or the wrong gateway added for the IP address and the net mask combo which is a simple you know, human input error somewhere in that chain of things. And when that happens, ESXi doesn't plumb up its network stack. And as a consequence, the, the machine never comes up on the network post install. And then it's like, oh gosh, you know, digital rebar is broken and what happened? Well, it turns out someone gave us bad input. We merrily went about our business of configuring the network with that bad information and we got a broken instance, and that's just no fun. 
so validation was born out of an example or use case for this as one, as one of many things to validate. Uh, one of the simple checks that we have, and basically there's a core library that's begun. It's not very full fleshed yet, but this core library in the templates validation lib template has a number of functions that can do various things. One of the various things is uh, check same subnet, which takes in an IP address, a gateway, and a net mask. Sorry, that's all kind of small there. And then just does a quick uh, subnet check calculation and determines if the gateway and the, the IP address are in the same uh, defined net mask boundary. And so this gives you the ability to execute a task that says, hey, validate that the IP gateway net mask is good. So before we go to plumb this business up and we get a failure, let's verify that it's good. Now, one of the, the things that we took a step back and we always try and do is extrapolate a use case in a pattern and make it a general uh, tool that's useful in a lot of different impl impl implementations. The subnet check is just one of many examples of things you can do. The validation content library itself is a flexible tool for driving uh, various uh, tasks through uh, dynamically assigning a parameter. So on a machine, and this is all documented, uh, Greg has done a good job of getting some uh, documentation uh, started on this. So if you go to our usual read the docs, content packages and plugins, uh, validation. Uh, there is a beginning of some of the validation uh, documentation pieces here Ooh. on how to drive the system. One of which is the validation list parameter, which can define, flexibly define a set of validation tasks to execute and run. Okay, there's a lot else that happens behind the hood. So one of the things that happens behind the hood is there's a start and a stop. And if you've defined this parameter, so we have a, like I was saying, we have a start and a stop. And if you set the validation list parameter um, to a list of things to test for, it will dynamically inject those as tasks into the currently running workflow context between the start and the stop stages. So it allows you to dynamically expand a set of validation tasks to run. Validation tasks can run at different stages. We have a couple of what we believe are sort of good places to run those, uh, that makes sense to run those, and that's when a machine has been first discovered and it's in Sledgehammer, uh, let's do, as part of the post-discover process, set of validation tasks. So this stage can be added to accomplish that. The post hardware task is designed to operate after you've done a bunch of hardware configuration. So an example might be BIOS configuration, firmware flashing, uh, RAID configuration, configuring the BMC. So the IPMI BMC subsystem, if you're setting IP addressing and information on that, and you need to uh, set all of that, um, then you are able to uh, specify a set of tasks to run at that sort of stage when this stage runs. And then finally, there's an example uh, post install, which allows you to, uh, after the OS has been installed, assuming you have an agent and a runner in place, uh, i.e. Derpy for ESXi or DRPCLI runner service for the other OSs, then this is a set of validation tasks that can run also. Greg, you had something you wanted to say about burn-in as well? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, post hardware is also useful for validating your burn in tests. So you may burn in for a while and you may want to run a set of validations to make sure that nothing broke or nothing disappeared or that kind of stuff. For example, you might choose to have uh, a validation task that checks the BMC's error log, right? For an error that may have shown up as part of your burn in testing. Right, oh, wow. exactly. So this would be the systems run up, running clean for this, and you could do it. But what happens if it fails the test? Well, there's a, yeah, so there's a number of uh, conditions if the tests fail. So uh, Greg, you want to cover just sort of the real fast, the uh, fail hard, fail soft sort of yeah, yeah. conditions? Yeah, so the idea is that uh, the stages 
or the task you build for the validation system can either do the normal exit zero for success, right? Or exit one for failure to stop. There's also a library helper that lets you, um, so like if you go into fatal, for example, and the tasks, well, okay. And here there's this add validation error. And so the idea is that you may have a failure in a validation step that will not be remediated or can't be remediated without additional work to the system that would require a full reboot and a re-operation pattern. In which case there you might choose to call the add validation error, give it a string to indicate what the failure is, and then return success to let the system continue through running validation tests so that you can build up a set of errors that you would need to remediate against. And then when the whole process gets to the validation stop task, it checks that parameter to say, are there any errors in it? If there are, now I'm gonna stop the process and print that error list. The idea is that a, um, you can choose to accumulate errors or not. And a lot of times we make the distinction about, um, is the error something that's easy to remediate, all right? So for example, say in the, uh, IP address example that Shane was talking about, that might be a simple parameter that needs to be edited on the machine. Once fixed, I can hit play and the system will continue forward, right? That's a pre-validation kind of thing that's making sure that parameters are set correctly so that future steps will work. That's one that you could easily remediate. One where you might not have that is like, I'm running a burn-in validation and I've done my burn in and it looks like one of the power supplies went out, right? The box is still working, it still kind of functions, but the power supply's out and we probably, before we want to put it in production, want to replace the power supply, right? That's not going to be a simple remediation per se. And it's something that once fixed, we probably want to drive through the process again. In that case, that would be an example of where I would want that task to call add validation error to say, power supply one is bad, fix, and then return success so that, that be, other errors could be accumulated and reported to be handled all, all in batch, right? So that's the distinction between those. And I poorly documented them because I can't name things worth a darn as uh, a fatal test returns one, a failed test returns a validation error and continues with the validation process. And there's example tasks. So like while Shane's showing the function, there's example tasks in the validation system where you can see a failed and a fatal, right? Where this is an example of, oh, sorry, I have it backwards. Fatal is I wanna stop processing right now. Don't make, don't make any forward progress. In that case, we just exit and set the validation error. In a failed case where I wanna record a failure right? I'm going to say always fails task, right? As a validation error. And then it's going to return success. And then eventually I'll get to the end of the, when the stop function and it'll print out that line and say, Hey, and it'll tell you the task. It'll say validation test fail, failed, always failing task. And then that way you can build up a list of things to remediate. Right? Also, this could be useful for things like, um, I expected to have a 32 gig system and I got a 16 gig system, right? That's not going to be a simple remediation, right? <laughs> um, so the idea is that you could build up a whole set of these validation errors that you want to remediate at the end. Okay. okay. Cool, awesome. Uh, thank you, Greg. Appreciate the input there. Uh, like I said, uh, digital rebar provision content validation is where the current framework lives. Uh, it is relatively new and will grow a lot of legs as many things do it uh, in the digital rebar project. Uh, I have a quick example here that actually incorporates a number of different content packs and pieces and parts. So let me see if I can burn through this really fast. We're about ready to wrap up. Um, but basically, there's two sets of validations that we're going to perform. Uh, I have two machines, and each of the machines has a profile 
Uh, one machine is set up to succeed, and it has two profiles actually that are good profiles. Uh, the first is an example of setting the ESXi uh, network first boot gateway IP address and netmasks. And if you look at these values and do your netmask calculations, you determine that these are in the same subnet, and this test should pass. Similarly, um, and this test would be run in the uh, uh, post discover stage, the IPMI demo good. Similarly, sets theoretically would set the IPMI address gateway and netmask, and these again are in the same subnet. This would run presumably in the post hardware stage, so after we've done BMC hardware configuration, maybe. There are different places where you might do that, but let's pretend that we're doing that in as a sort of group of hardware tasks that we're going to execute, and now we want to validate, uh, or we want to validate this information prior to setting that uh, on the machine. Uh, in addition, there's a machine that's set up with bad info, which is clone two, and so the IP ad or bad. Um, so, for example, our sysadmin, whoever he happens to be, um, input the wrong gateway uh, with a typo of 124, uh, 142.1 instead of 124.1. So this will cause ESXi to fail. We want to catch this prior to uh, actually trying to plumb up ESXi, and similarly. Uh, IPMI address is bad, although I think we have a hard fail in here, so we actually won't get to this. Um, we should have done this as a soft fail. Uh, we'll make that better in the future. Um, we're going to drive this through uh, a workflow that I set up as a quick demo workflow that essentially replicates a, a discover workflow that might be in operation. This is a much more condensed version of uh, seven stages, whereas you might see somewhere around you know, 15 or 20 or 30 stages in a, a full production environment with all the integration. But it, the primary pieces we're interested in here is the validation post discover is where we're going to do some, a set of validation stages and then the validation post hardware stage, we'll do another set. And in between those is a fake hardware setup where you might have done some hardware setup operations or something to that effect. To actually drive the implementation or the use of this, uh, we must set the the values uh, of tasks to run. So there's a, a profile here that's called just validation test, which sets the all important validation post discover and validation post hardware uh, parameters to a set of tests to run. So this uh, temp subnet check one will do the ESXi. It's called temp because we were trying to slam up. I, I was trying to slam a Python three into a Python 2.7 environment. It was my, my fault. Um, Greg fixed that in the background. The other one is this IPMI network configuration uh, validation that we're going to run. So those are the two validation steps that we're going to run. And if we uh, execute, uh, if you will see that we're in our this discover inventory stage, but we're going to switch to this validation test stage and kick off the tests. And we'll see that uh, crossing our fingers, we get the first machine where the validation addressing was correct, there were no errors in that. Everything succeeded and the machine is marked runnable. However, clone 02, which had the two profiles that defined bad data that represented uh, failure data, um, it's failed and we failed in this first uh, set of tasks and we get this, these do not match error message, exit one, validation failed. So there's a, a very quick example of the validation failing. If we actually go back to the machines and let's say, uh, this is probably not particularly um, super valid, but if we go and add on the profiles, we remove the bad profiles and we add uh, good and we add good profiles, now we have good information, we restart the test, and it runs through successfully. So we remediated the problem, and now we have a successful test pass. Uh, now, obviously, the IP addressing in those uh, profiles are the same, and that's a bad thing in its, of itself, but it, it sort of demonstrates remediating a problem on the fly and fixing it. So that's uh, it in a summary, uh, validation. Actually, yeah, no, I have one other thing to add real quick. Because- Fire away, Greg. There's a uniqueness in the in those parameters that's different than all other parameters. So 
when you specify those uh, parameters that define the tests, they are not there. Those parameters are processed across the full set of content associated with that machine. The idea is that I can have all those instances of that parameter in various different profiles and stages and global profile get aggregated together. So the idea is that you can define the tests for a particular component. And for example, like the IPMI subsystem, add that profile that defines the IPMI tests and move forward along that process so that you don't have to worry about aggregating together all of those tests you want to run into one instance of that parameter. It actually pulls them across all of the content associated with that machine. So it's a combined, so it breaks the normal parameter processing rule. So that's a very important thing we should probably mention in our documentation. I thought I did, but I will check. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, that's pretty much it. Is if there are any last minute questions on validation, we'll wrap up for the day and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. So any last questions? You guys previously had a you guys previously had a tool where we could do regular expression matching, and with validation, you've sort of given us the ability to do uh, it just submit our own scripts, I guess. Um, yeah, we were talking about like go ahead. Yeah, so there's parts of that in the inventory check system, so yeah. it could do parts. We're the next step on some of the stuff is to convert the inventory check pieces into validation tasks that can be included mm -hmm. at various points in the process. And then the, a lot of those functions and helper functions will move from the inventory check piece into the validation library. Okay. Awesome. All right, everyone, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Uh, Digital Rebar Provision Platform Meetup 43 is done. We will see you in two weeks for Meetup 44.